I have a, a great memory of just before Christmas speaking to that lady because she was heading to the northeast, like I say, to play at New Year's Eve. And we got talking about mooses in the countryside and how mooses and deer are so dangerous when they run at your car. It's like we could have done half an hour on deer and mooses, you know. She lives in the middle of nowhere. Candy Staten and Young Hearts run free. Staten, Staten, she told me it was definitely Staten, but I've always said Staten. She should know, what with it being her name and everything. Now, here we are. It's Monday afternoon on BBC Newcastle Radio for the North East. 35 years ago, maybe 36 now, actually, the Jam performed their last ever gig. It was in Brighton. In either a fine piece of planning or some marvellous serendipity surrounding this fact, I spoke to the drummer from the jam, Rick Buckler, about this new book which he's got. It's called Dead Straight Guide to the Jam. Started by asking him, considering it was a major jammiversary, <laughs> what were his feelings before and after that last gig? Can you remember that? You know? Well, obviously beforehand, we, I mean, I really felt that it wasn't going to happen, that Paul might change his mind, because we knew in the summer that um, you know that he decided he was going to leave the band, so we sort of had all these commitments to do the last tour and um, etc. And, and quite a lot of other stuff to do. So we it, we sort of quite gentlemanly walked towards the, you know the final show thirty five years ago. Was it Paul that broke the news to you? You say in the summer. Did he suddenly come along and say, right, okay, listen, this is what's happening? Sort of. I mean, uh, we we were in a recording studio. We were booked to go into a uh, for a couple of days, do some some tracks. And and John pretty much sort of pushed him over towards me and Bruce uh, and said that Paul's got something to say, you know, because obviously John had been trying to talk him out of it for about two days before that. Uh, so that's the way it sort of came about. And then, you know, I mean, I think the original idea from Paul was that he wasn't going to say anything to me or Bruce until um, we'd done the sort of lunch on the tour that we had in wow, UK at that time. Wow, you can't do that. <laughs> I know well, exactly. I think somebody sort of, you know, at the record company said to him, no, you, exactly Come on. that, you know. You, yeah, yeah, you've got you've got to you know you've got to sort of say this now, sort of thing. I mean, it was a secret that we tried to keep um, for as long as we could. But I mean, after about about six weeks in after that decision was made, everybody knew um, it. It wasn't. It was a bit of an open secret in that respect. Isn't it ironic as well that during that last year and during that last six months, you know, you were achieving the most success you'd ever known. I know it was it was great, and the last shows were actually fabulous. I mean, we really played our hearts out, and um, I think we thought, me, me and Bruce thought that you know because things are going so well, that maybe Paul would have a change of heart, you know, and um, rethink things a little bit. But um, I mean, Bruce was, would would argue with him and say, well, look, why don't you just you know go off and do something that you want to do for a year, but don't actually sort of split the band and you know don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and uh, and then after a year if you still feel the same way fair enough you know I mean you've got to respect somebody's decision on on something like that um, but he wasn't going to have any of that which was um, a real shame because it didn't give us the sort of chance to you know wind the band down in a way that we felt we probably could yeah. have done up you know but anyway there you go it's all done and dusted it's a long time ago now, but it is that 35 years milestone, isn't it? Just before he said to you, right, you know, I uh, decided to, you know, split the band up, were you all getting on well or were the problems in the camp? No, we were getting on fine. Um, this is what's a little bit mystifying. You know, the records were still selling, the tours were really good. Um, you know, the, 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 the record company was happy. They were, you know, quite prepared to sort of continue, uh, you know, recording and, and, you know, another contract coming up and, and what have you. Yeah. So yeah. everything was going so well, it was almost, well, it was a real smackaroo blurdy, you know, so what do you right. do? The Dead Straight Guide to the Jam is Rick Buckler's book. And looking back, I mean, some less enlightened minds may think the jam was the Paul Weller show. However... The band, you know, I think I'm right in saying, you correct me if I'm wrong, was the sum of its parts. You played a huge part in that. Did you ever, I suppose my question is, did you ever feel overshadowed, Rick? No, I mean, I think when, you know, when the band was was, was up and running, I mean, we we all threw in. I mean, we, we, it was the live show was all between the three of us. Whenever there was any songs to be put together for the recording or demos or whatever, it was always the three of us that did it. Um, we all did the press together. Um, and one of the things that Paul always insisted was that, you know, we did that sort of thing, that we, it wasn't, 
it wasn't all laid on Paul's shoulders that when we went out and did these press interviews or whatever, all three of us would turn up for it. Um, and, and, you know, there was one or two occasions when maybe, um, uh, you know, we did them on our own. But generally speaking, we were a band and we did everything together. Has there been a single day that's gone past in these 35 years where somebody hasn't in some form mentioned the jam? Um, not many, <laughs> um, to be honest, you know, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's our own fault, isn't it? I mean, it's going to follow us around all the time. I don't it's... think it was a fault, was it? I think it was, <laughs> it was an amazing thing that shaped people's lives, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a big part it, well, it, of all three of our lives. I mean, it set us on, on a course, you know, for everything that's happened since, which is just absolutely fabulous. So no complaints at all, really, not for me in any case, um, <laughs> You know, I just think that it, 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 you know, as life is, it never seems to pan out the way that you sort of want it to. Um, but I'm, I'm, I like surprises. But that, you know, that one was a, that one was a biggie, really. <laughs> I remember seeing you on a TV show called After They Were Famous. You were a cabinet maker, and your drum kit appeared to be stuck in a what looked like a compost heap. Were you, were you happy to be out of the music biz? Um. <laughs> What, at the time, I just wanted to step away from the music industry um, and just for a couple of years, just do something, indulge myself for me. You know, it's a bit of a selfish thing, but I, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and and I, you had plenty of money, presumably, to be able to do this as well, you know, which is always nice. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say I had plenty. I had enough. I mean, I was, I was, I was okay. I mean, I still had to work. Um, and I... Based, when, well, when I first... Uh, when I was at school, I, I made my own drum kit. I mean, because I've always been quite good with my hands and that sort of thing. So I thought, well, this would be a lovely opportunity to sort of, re, you know, revive that sort of skill. So I went into, um, you know, making furniture and then learned how to restore furniture. And Who knew he restored furniture? <laughs>